Otherwise, uh, we're going to have Dave Hughes, who's going to come up. Let's just give him a warm welcome. And let's just pray for Dave as he gets ready to speak this morning, Lord. We thank you for this guy. He's a great guy who loves you, Lord. And I thank you for all the preparation he's put in this week and in the coming last few weeks, Lord, to prepare for today, to bring this message of what you want to say to us. So I want to pray for us, Lord, that we may open up our hearts to hear what you want to say to us through Dave. And let us receive and hear the word of God this morning and empower him, Lord, to be filled with your spirit to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks very much. God wants to say something to us today. He's been saying it to me. He wants to talk to us, he wants to talk to you today about how he's the way, we've already heard about that today, how he's the way in your unknown. He's the way in my unknown. And the passage we're going to look at today addresses one of the biggest questions that we have about what's going to happen in the future, about how things are going to play out, that uncertainty that comes when we don't know what's going to happen. That may be you today. It's it's all of us at some point. In fact, quite often it's us. That's exactly where I've been over the last couple of months. There's a potential change in my job. And I've been asked, well, what's that going to mean? What's that going to mean for my family? Is it the right thing to do? Is it the right choice? How do I talk to this person about that change? All these unknowns, all these uncertainties. You might have an unknown or an uncertainty today. You might have got GCSE or A-level results this week or a couple of weeks ago and be thinking about what you're going to do next. Maybe you're going through a change. Maybe going off to university and you don't know who you're going to be with what they're going to be like, what the people you're going to stay with are going to be like. Maybe it's unknowns about your finances and how that's going to plan out. Maybe it's unknowns about what's going to happen when your kids do leave home and they're not there. Maybe it's unknowns about your health. Maybe it's unknowns about a relationship. Maybe you're in that early stage of a relationship where you're like, are they going to text me? Do they feel the same way as I feel? We all feel that sort of thing. And that's exactly where, in that sense of unknown that we all feel, we find Jesus, well, we find his disciples with Jesus as we come into today's passage. Now, I want you to use your imaginations. Kids, you can do this as well if you want. Use your imaginations. This is a really powerful thing to do when you're looking uh, at the Bible. Get into what's actually happening in this scenario. And we're going to be in John 14 today, but in John 13, we see that Jesus and his 12 closest followers are in a room on their own. And they're in a room on their own because they are keeping a low profile. It's been a weird week. Monday, they were coming into Jerusalem. People were laying palm branches down. It was, you know, party time. Everything was looking good. Since then, things have gone downhill quickly as far as their Jesus followers are concerned. Now, he's been kicking over tables, saying the temple is going to be destroyed, and people are trying to kill him. And so they're in this room, keeping a low profile. And to make things, I don't know if the word is worse, but at least weirder, they're having this special meal together in the room. Just Jesus and his 12 closest followers. They're having this meal together, and it's been a weird meal. We've all had one of these weird meals. Maybe you stayed or went to someone's house over the summer, stayed with some family or something. And I mean, I remember this as a teenager. You go and have uh, have dinner and stay at someone's house. And you come home and you just think, my family's actually not so bad. <laughs> that was weird. Or maybe you've had one of those family meals where someone drops an absolute clangor and then it's just like tension for the rest of the meal because it's just so awkward and you just want to, oh no, or well, they've stormed out or whatever. This is one of those, that's, this is how they're feeling. Because to stop, before they even started eating, Jesus started washing their feet. Now, that's... That's weird by today's standards, but it was weird by those days' standards because there was no way Jesus should have been washing their feet. That was, you know, not what they were okay with. That was not culturally okay. Then Jesus says that one of the 12 people in that room is going to betray him. Yeah, keep it light. They're having this festival meal. It's the same time every, same way every time. This time, they haven't got the main course. And then as we come to the end of chapter 13... You're going to see Jesus, just to keep them on their toes, says this to them. He says, um, verse 33 of chapter 13, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You'll look for me, 
And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. These are the guys who left everything for Jesus. They've put all their eggs in one basket, and he's just told them they're off. he's off. <laughs> I mean, this has not been an easy week or an easy meal for these guys. They have got questions. They are, you know, they are uncertain, unstable. And Jesus knows that. He's aware. And as we come into verse 14 in just a second, you're going to see that. But Jesus knows about your uncertainty as well. He knows about what is troubling you. You might want to just take that unknown that you've got and hold it before Jesus now and listen to his response as we come to the beginning of chapter 14. Now this is what it says, beginning of chapter 14. This is Jesus speaking to those disciples in their unknown, in their uncertainty. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. I love Jesus' response at the beginning there. He knows how they're feeling. He's not surprised. And the first thing he says is just this great caring response. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Don't worry. Don't fret. Now, why? Why, why does Jesus say? What reason does Jesus give in the middle of their uncertainty, which I think, given everything we just said, they've got good reason to feel a bit uncertain and a bit worried. Yeah. Jesus doesn't, he's not downplaying their problem, but what reason does he give to say don't worry? Well, the reason that first part of today's passage gives in dealing with their unknown is that there is a promise of a future reunion in the Father's house. Now, I want you to see that in verse 2. If we could pop that back up for a second. You'll see it in verse 2 and in verse 3. Jesus is going to prepare a place for you. And where is it going to be? It's going to be in the Father's house. It's not, it's not somewhere else. It's not outside. He's not gone to prepare heaven, this, this arbitrary white floating place where you're just going to go in a, a room. No, no, he's gone to, gone to prepare the house. This is like the prodigal son. You're going to get invited in. You're going to get a robe put on. You're coming in the father's house. You're not stuck outside waiting. He's saying you can have peace because you're invited into the father's house. And I think it's also important to realize that he's gone, when he says he's gone to prepare the house, it's not that it needs decorating. He hasn't not come back for 2,000 years because like everybody on Grand Designs, he underestimated the scale of the task or you know, he's still cutting in around the edges. That's not what's happening. When he says he's preparing a place for you, he's talking, about, he's talking to them about his death and resurrection. That's how he made the way that we're going to see. That's what he's preparing. Oh, he's preparing this opportunity for you to go to the Father's house and spend eternity with a God who loves you. He says, that, that's what I'm going to do. And that is just the most wonderful promise, a future reunion in the Father's house. But you might think, as you're going to see in a second, the disciples think, those comforts are wonderful, but they're a long way away from my situation right now. You know, I'm looking for death or the second coming. And what, until then I hang on? How does that help now when I'm wondering how to parent my kids, as Dave rightly pointed out earlier, or in your health situation? It gives us an incredible perspective for the future. But Jesus has got more to say into your situation right now. And Jesus does something really surprising that the disciples did not see coming. Let's keep going in John chapter 14. We'll pick up halfway through where we left off. It says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? 
And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, yeah, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles or the works themselves. You can see why Thomas feels the way he feels. Jesus says, you know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas says, we don't know. They still think he's going on a journey or something. We don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. It's their unknown. This is just, this whole passage is just the most incredible unpacking of Jesus, preparing his disciples for him going away, preparing us, actually, for living in a time where he's gone to be with the Father. There's so much in here. We could spend months in this package, in this passage, but what's the heart of this incredible, massive claim that Jesus makes? He says, don't be troubled, speaking into their unknown. Don't be troubled. Don't worry about your unknown. Because through me, I'm going to give you access to the Father. I am the way. I am the way in your unknown. And this, this term, the way, is actually really important. Literally, it means like a pathway or a road. Um, but it came to define the early church, the early Christians. Before they were called Christians, they were known as followers of the way. Throughout the book of Acts, you'll see them followers of the way. And they weren't just um, people who knew something about Jesus. They were committed people following this completely radical way of life. But there's something about this claim to be the way that's really important. You've got to get hold of if you really want to know Jesus and really understand what he's saying. And it's the exclusivity of that claim. He doesn't say, I'm a way. He says, I am the way. I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I and only I, says Jesus, am the way. But this actually, for those early followers of the way, and actually, as you'll realize in a second for us today, it's quite problematic. The early followers of Jesus, those followers of the way, became the most persecuted people at that time. And here's the reason. The culture at that time was one of many gods. So different um, uh, cultures would have different gods. You would have Roman gods, Greek gods. If you lived in a particular city, you'd have a city god. If you lived in a particular town, you'd have a town god. They even had gods depending on your job. So there was leather-working gods, metal-working gods. If you had a big enough house and family, then maybe you'd have your own family gods. And Everybody had their own gods. Everyone was cool with that. But if you came to my house, you needed to honor my God. You needed to light a candle or do some sort of honoring thing to honor my God. And that was the culture. You know, everyone had their own gods. Everyone was cool with that, but you wanted each other's gods. Now, the Jews weren't having that, but the Romans just thought that the Jews were a bit of an odd bunch. They were one family unit who had these different practices, and they could deal with that. The problem with the Christians, or the followers of the way came along, is that all of a sudden you started getting Greek and Roman Christians. You started getting people getting uh, turned to followers of Jesus within your family, within your guild, or within whatever. And all of a sudden, these people from across the societal spectrum are saying, actually, we can't bow down to your idols anymore. I can't honor your family God. Because there's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one way to fullness of life. And this led to huge persecution for them. Isn't that a bit similar to our current cultural moment? It's not a household god anymore, is it? But it's the, the idol of the self. 
you know, and my truth and whatever I say, you've got to honor. You know, you don't have to believe the same as me, but you've got to, you've got to honor and you've got to acknowledge whatever I believe. That's our current cultural moment. But Jesus claims he's the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only through my death and resurrection can you be reunited with the Father and live with him for eternity. That's Jesus' radical claim. He is the only way. Now, the thing with that way is that the disciples weren't very happy with his answer, were they? Philip straight away comes back, he wants more details. You see, and actually, if we were to go back into chapter 13, you'd see the same. When Jesus said he'd going away, Peter says, where are you going? Thomas, we don't know where you're going. Philip, oh yeah, just show us a bit more. They want a bit more detail. That's, that, was, that was me. That, you know, when I've been praying about my job and stuff like that, I didn't want a good feeling. I wanted to understand the financial implications. I wanted to understand the practical implications. I wanted to understand that I wasn't going to put my foot in it and look a lemon. Um, I wanted a bit more detail from Jesus. That's what they're after. They're a bit after a bit more detail. You sometimes a bit like that? Absolutely. But Jesus makes it pretty clear that's not what he's offering. Instead, his call is to trust him. Go back to his original call to those 12. When he originally called them, he said, follow me. Jesus' radical claim to his disciples in the middle of their unknown situation, in the middle of their worry, was that he was what they should be looking for. And he was right there with them. We see it in verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. See it in verse 9. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I am in the father and the father's in me? Jesus came here. He's the goal. He's what we should be looking for. In him is fullness of life. In him is that security and purpose that we're looking for. And we're mortal. We can't know the future quite like that. And some things are out of our control. In fact, most things. The older I get, the more I realize that most things are out of my control. And so Jesus' question to us is, can you trust me in the midst of that? Can you trust me in the middle of your unknown, with the little things? Can you trust me with the big things? Will you do what Hannah was challenging us on? Read scripture, get to know Jesus, worship, spend time, pray, really seek after him. Can you say that the easy answer is you just got to trust Jesus more? Well, yeah. But it's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to say, yeah, you, I mean, as a solution to your unknowns and the, the unknown in your life that you're worrying about is just to trust Jesus more. And that is the answer. But Jesus doesn't just leave us hanging there. He's got, he's got more for them and he's got more for you. It's not just a future promise of being in heaven, reunited with the Father for eternity. He understands our situation now, and he wants to speak into it. I believe, actually, that this is specifically for some of you today. We're going to jump down to verse 16 in the same chapter, John 14. Jesus has been continuing to encourage his disciples, preparing them for what's going to happen. And in verse 16, Jesus says this to them, still in the room. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, your comforter or encourager or counselor. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, another comforter to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. That's what they're worried about. They're worried that he's going away. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. 
And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, just as I am in you. He's in you. That's the offer that's available today. Jesus wants to be with you. When the helper, when the Holy Spirit came, Jesus came. That's what he says. I will be with you. I am going to be in you. Not just at the second coming, not just when you die and you go to be with the Father. Right now, there is an opportunity to have Jesus with you in your unknown. He is the way in your unknown right now. I just love it. That promise. Jesus knows how they're feeling. He knows what they need. He knows that they're worried he's going away. And he says, I'm not going to leave you. He's not left you right now in your situation. Some of you might be feeling a bit abandoned in it. And like, you know, you just got to, you know, just plod through. He hasn't abandoned you in your situation. He will give you, if you ask, or he has given you another comforter, encourager, counselor, advocate to help you and be with you forever. I don't know how that's going to work, but I know what he's like. I know that he's kind. I know that he's good. I know that he's alive and he's active and that he is the way in your unknown. So you can believe in him you can follow him, you can trust him, and he will be with you. And not just passively with you, like you know, he sort of sat on the right hand of the Father a long way off, not doing very much, but at least he's there. No, no, he's with you to help. Emotionally, spiritually, practically, financially, he's there to help by his spirit. And until he returns, and we have that guaranteed place in the Father's house with Jesus, with the Father forever, he's there. With us now, with us forever. Jesus' death and resurrection made that way for you in eternity to the Father's house, with him. It's the only way, unpopular as that may be. And until then, until we go and see him, either he comes back or we go and see him directly. You can trust him, follow him, know him and experience that spirit-filled life right now. And look, there are some of you today who have never experienced Jesus like that. You don't know he's the way. You've not experienced that spirit comfort. We would love to chat to you at the end. We've got Alpha courses coming up. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. Because if you feel like you're in one of those unknowns at the moment, Jesus is the way. And he wants to reveal himself to you. But some of you are looking at an unknown and you're feeling a bit stumped. You don't know the way or the how and you're feeling that trouble, that stuck, that unknown that those disciples were feeling. And Jesus wants to tell you today, he is the way in your unknown. He says he's going to be with you, in you. And so this week, if you're feeling that trouble or uncertainty coming and you don't know the way, and you're wondering where Jesus is in your situation, here's the promise that he's got for you. He, himself, by his spirit, is wanting to come in to your situation, to help. To help. Will you let him? Will you trust him to be the way in your unknown? Can we have the band back up? We're just going to take a minute to pray. And then we'll hand back over to Rachel and the team. Jesus, we want to thank you for the truth that you are the way, the truth and the life, that you are all we need. We want to thank you that through your death and resurrection, you made a way to the Father. And so that in the midst of all of our unknowns, we can look to you and turn to you and know that you're with us right now. We want to ask, Holy Spirit, would you come reveal Jesus to us? Would you help us in our unknowns? We lay them before you now. And we say, Jesus, you are enough for us. We trust you. Amen.